It's a sparkling pheasant shoot day in Derbyshire. Sparklingly cold too. The seated gun says how he keeps warm. I think you just got to wrap up, I think layer up, wrap up and try and keep as warm as you can on these types of days. Precision rifle shooting comes of age and gets a slot at the home of shooting, Bisley. We've been trying over the last four or five years and we're finally here today, so it's an epic, exciting event for us all. We have an update on the proposed ban on lead ammo, shotgun cartridges, rifle bullets and air gun pellets. Kayat Brin gives us his recipe for venison burgers. Mark Ripley tests the Hick Micro Alpex Thermal in this week's field tester film. Warm up your January, we're giving away a case of gin from the Wrecking Coast Distillery in Cornwall, priced at the thick end of £200. David is back on the new stump and James Marchington has hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. It's a frosty December morning in the lovely Derbyshire Dales, and we're joining JP Goda for a driven pheasant day run by the Jones family at Big Inn. <laughs> JP shoots from a wheelchair and has his own YouTube channel, The Seated Gun. Lovely little family shoot. We've just done a nice little entry drive uh, for the day here, which has uh, provided us with some nice birds. And we certainly saw some nice tall cock pheasants coming out on the right side of us. So yeah, we took a few nice birds as well. So we can't complain to the start of the day. Today, we are on the faithful Zenith. Um, so Ely Zenith. Uh, Zenith is lead. I'm using a 34.4 today. We're sticking with the lead today. I've got preferences and I'm sure most guns have. And I think um, steel is something that you have to change the way you shoot, change the way you think about how you're going to place, where you're going to place the shot to the bird. And also it varies massively, I think, on, on the height and the, uh, the size of the birds. Today, you know, yes, um, I think if there was partridge flying, I think steel would be a great, a great shell for today. Um, but then some of these cock birds, as you've seen, James, the few that came down around us, um, they're good sized birds. And I just, hand on heart, I think, all the manufacturers, not just some, I think all of them have got, um, uh, uh, you know, work to do to get these steels to where someone who is used to lead is going to use a steel as a direct comparison rather than as a, an alternative. I think the season started with a lot of trepidation, a lot of concerns. We, you know, we had sort of partridge shortages, bird flu overseas, bird flu here, all sorts of different things going on. But I think, hand on heart, I think the season is now starting to sort of pan out a little bit now and uh, we've managed to get a lot of days in, we've been north, south, east and west, and uh, we've still got more to go in January. So uh, we've certainly had a, our fair share of shoots this season. We can't complain, James. <laughs> Henry's loading for me. Henry is one of the sons. And then you've got Rich, who is the other son, who is working the beat line. Uh, we're here today for Ian, who's uh, dad, who's the big boss. It's his birthday, so uh, we have been very kindly invited by him to join him on his birthday shoot today with him and some close friends. Um, and then mum is back at the house and she's preparing all food and hospitality and looking after us and getting us all warm back there, hopefully, when we go back to Elevenses. JP's a very good friend and um, we've had him previous. There's not many places the uh, Polaris Rangers can't go to, so it's not a problem for us at all, really. Um, we can pretty much get, get someone in a wheelchair to every peg that they need to be on. And it shoots all right, doesn't it? Hits a few. Not too bad, not too <laughs> bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what's the secret to being a leader? Is there a special knack to it? I suppose there is, really. I think that the biggest thing is people tend to rush and they think, oh, there's a lot of birds coming away. And as soon as you start rushing, you start fumbling and you better just take your time stuff the cartridges in. I like to just say yes to the gun so he knows he can close his gun. Um, obviously not shouting it, but yeah. otherwise you could end up getting your fingers trapped in it or something, <laughs> which has been known. Um, yeah. But yeah, just to take your time, to be honest. Yeah. One in each hand and in. 
the time they've shot those two cartridges, you've picked two more out anyway, so... It's a freezing cold day, so the talk at break time naturally turns to the best way of keeping warm. Tweeds generally keep you really nice and warm anyway, um, but certainly today is one of those days where thermals are required, I think. So I think you just got to wrap up, I think layer up, wrap up and try and keep as warm as you can on these types of days. I think the biggest issue is when, it's, when it is as cold as what it is today is that you, you automatically as... Uh, you know, you tighten up and you keep everything sort of close because you don't want to you don't want to let any air circulate. But the problem being in, in doing that, of course, is then when you do go to raise your gun, that's when then you end up where it's not in the right place or you're pulling muscles or whatever else, you know, goes on. So I think you've just got to be as relaxed as you can and, you know, just try and stay as warm as you can. We are actually quite fortunate because the sun's behind us. So we had a nice little bit of warmth on the back of our necks and on the back on our backs. But uh, it's just everywhere else is still it's still frozen. JP has come up with a brilliant idea which he thinks could make some enterprising gun maker a fortune. Anyone that comes up with a heated gun, so uh, if we go down the lines of a heated steering wheel in a car, if we've got a heated fore-end, heated stock, um, I think that would be uh, rather nice to say the least. <laughs> and I think it uh, might in increase the volume of shooters out in those colder climates. <laughs> <laughs> JP's wife Katie does all the filming and editing for their YouTube channel and she has recently raised her game with a new piece of kit. This is the third time I've ever used it. <laughs> <laughs> it's doing pretty well. What we really would like to see is that bird coming towards you and give you that bird's eye view. Um, but it's you're never going to know where the bird's coming from. You never know where, where the, if the gun's going to hit it. So we've got to at least try, haven't we? So we'll just put it up there, have a look. And I mean, there's some stunning scenery here as well. So we're able to capture some of the, um, the scenery at the same time, but it's worth a try. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Any, any particular sort of tips and tricks you've learned in your first few flights? YouTube is definitely your friend. They will definitely give you some good guidance. Um, and I think they say RTFM, don't they? Read the manual. <laughs> um, women are quite good at picking up manuals. Um, and yeah, I've, I've had to have a go. It's, it's uncomfortable sort of the first couple of times your heart beats throwing through your throat when you uh, think you're actually going to lose it but yeah. it will come back eventually so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you hope it's a dgi uh, mini 2 ultra light so actually it's quite good because we haven't got any restrictions on um we don't need any uh, licenses because of the weight of it um, which means that we can actually fly it anywhere. And in all honesty, because we're in private land, we don't have a problem with um, where we're going to be flying it anyway. So it takes some getting used to um, and just connects to your iPhone and throw it up in the air and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's taken a shot at it, but I have crashed it. The first time I ever used it, I threw it into a tree. I was so concerned about putting it into um, uh, the ground that actually um, I put it into a tree, but... Amazingly, it survived and it's lived to flight another day. So yeah, good. I am not a professional when it comes to cameras. Um, I'm sort of, I have a go and sort of throw it all together as, as we've uh, been going. We, this has just been me and Jean-Paul um, throwing this together as we've been going and learning. Every day is a learning curve. So every time we come out into the field, we're learning and trying something new and we're coming up with ideas together. So for this drive, this is one of one of the first drives that uh, we've actually had it up in the air the whole time to see if we can get that bird's eye view. So well, I won't actually know till I get back to see if we've got any good footage. Please check out the seated gun on YouTube and uh, come and see if we've got any good footage. <laughs> it's the only way I can find out. So that'll be the way you'll find out too. <laughs> Drive two was just around the corner. We've come round onto drive three, the Thorns. We are on a really quite a steep slope. And the reason the Polaris is behind us is literally because the ground is a bit icy and it's really hard. I, um, I'm struggling to find somewhere to dig in to uh, keep my balance. So put the Polaris behind us so I can lean against that and uh, hopefully not roll down the hill. As I keep saying, James, it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality. And I'd rather have birds that we can remember than birds that we've, you know, you take loads of and you, you don't really remember where you've shot them or what drive it was or why you shot them or why it was such a great bird. You know, and we took a great right to left crosser. We took a lovely bird that was straight over the top of us and we actually had a left to right crosser. So, you know, we had one of 
of each angle, which was great. And they were all good cock birds, all 40 yarders. Um, so, you know, yeah, not a lot to complain about really on this drive. Like blistering. But the Jones family are just, they're wonderful people. You know, they're all about shooting and conservation, the countrywide, they're country people. And, you know, they want to provide the best day for the guns. And, you know, the nice thing is there's no pressure. Yes, it's a commercial shoot, of course it is. And it has to be profitable because that's how these places stay in business. But in the same angle, you know, the way that it's you're looked after here and the way that the family sort of make you feel part of their family is, is something that's really very, very special. Everyone as a gun imagines pheasant shooting and you're sort of up there in your vertical, but these were pheasant that were required to be shot in front, like a partridge really, which feels very, very strange to say the least. But what the keepers tell us to do is what we're going to do. So uh, we made sure there's plenty of blue sky behind them. They were all 20, 25 metres, but they were just, you know, you were shooting them out front rather than vertical. But all the same, good sporting, challenging birds. I think we've had a tough day. Um, you know, we've got bright sky, we've got very, very frosty morning, no wind. So I think it's been a tough old day for getting the birds up. But you know, the birds that have got up have been good birds. This drive, especially, I think, is all about the positioning. We're on the top of a hill, the rest of the guns are banking down. So they're, they're going where we are to where the rest of the guns are. There's probably a 25 meter drop. Where we were, we literally were probably 25 meter birds maximum uh, and there were a few uh, we took two really nice hen birds uh, left to right crossers uh, took a couple of nice cock birds on on the on the right on the left hand side as well so you know as I keep saying it's not about the quantity it's about the quality and uh, you know once again the quality has been great it's a lovely day it's no pressure nothing's too much trouble and that's what this is all about. It's not just about how many birds you shoot, it's about the whole, the whole experience of a day and having a nice day out in the countryside. And I think we've had that and some today. For more about Ely cartridges, go to elyhawklimited.com. You can find JP on YouTube as The Seated Gun. Thank you, JP, and all who took part in that. Now, let's talk booze. The winner of this week's prize draw gets 180 pounds worth of slow gin like this six bottles from the wonderful Wrecking Coast Gin Distillery, which is co-owned by a member of the Field Sports Nation. If you would like to know how to enter the draw, watch the Field Sports Nation's own TV show, Field Sports Extra, which is out on Tuesdays, and you can do that by joining the Field Sports Nation for a fiver a month. Now from Cornish Energy Drinks to David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. A hunt saboteur who hit a 81-year-old pensioner over the head has been found guilty of assault. A video captured the moment the sab beat an 81-year-old pensioner with a camera lens before screaming abuse at him as he struggled to get up. The incident took place while the Blackmore Vale in Dorset was trail hunting. The sab was found guilty of assault by beating after a trial at Weymouth Magistrates Court and fined £959. The Countryside Alliance has published an interactive map of meets taking place this Boxing Day. Hundreds of hunts are taking place across the UK. People can enjoy the colour and spectacle of the horses and hounds who will be out whatever the weather. Visitors of all ages are expected at the social gatherings which bring communities together. They're advised to wrap up warm and will be offered hot drinks and nibbles. See the link below for the map. Boxing Day meets offer hunts the perfect opportunity to showcase their hounds and demonstrate their lawful hunting activities to the public, the media, politicians and the police, whilst giving the wider world the chance to better understand what makes us all so passionate about following hounds. Angling organisations have taken the battle to save bluefin tuna fishing to the government. The UK Bluefin Tuna Association and the Angling Trust met Fisheries Minister Mark Smith to put their case for keeping the current catch and release programme or replacing it with a recreational fishery. In the last two years, anglers tagged more than 1,800 bluefin tuna in UK waters under a government research programme called CHART. 
DEFRA indicates that it won't go ahead in 2023. No decision has been made yet about a recreational fishery in 2023. There is likely to be some kind of scientific programme, but what we're really pushing for is to open a, a fully licensed recreational fishery. And if it doesn't happen in 23, I'm sure it'll happen in 2024. A shooter who had an illegal gun has been jailed for more than five years. As well as 17 legally held guns, police found a sawn-off shotgun behind a fridge at a house in Dover. They also found that the man held 2,300 22 bullets, while his FAC allowed him to hold 2,000. They claimed he was preparing for a siege. At an earlier hearing, the judge threw out the police's allegations and found the man instead used his guns for game shooting and was something of a prepper. The man pleaded guilty to possessing a prohibited firearm, possessing a firearm without a certificate and possessing ammunition without a certificate. He was jailed for five years and 10 months. An investigation has shown that grouse moors did not burn heather illegally. The BBC reported RSPB accusations of illegal muir burn by moorland keepers. Now a DEFRA investigation finds that moorland managers had not broken the law by burning heather on areas of protected deep peat. Out of 1,500 reports of illegal burning, there was only one technical breach of regulations and one estate was issued with a formal warning. Antis, including RSPB, Greenpeace and Wild Moors, urged the public to report all instances, which led to confusion as people began reporting legitimate heather burning carried out for conservation purposes. The Moorland Association condemns the exercise, which alarms the public and demonises grouse moors. Government figures reveal that livestock farms polluted rivers 300 times in 2021, causing 20 major incidents. Six farms were prosecuted in 2021, with the Environment Agency mainly giving out warning letters to the rest. The government says prosecution was a last resort for persistent offenders. The dairy industry is linked to half of all farm pollution. Four men have been jailed for over 31 years for burgling a gun shop. They were caught after one of their phones was used to call for a takeaway from the scene of the crime. The men stole firearms and ammunition from Hardy's gunsmith in Sheffield. Phone checks confirmed that one of the men placed an order from a local takeaway for two lamb burger meals, and this placed him at the scene of the burglary. Almost half of the firearms stolen have been successfully recovered, with some in West Yorkshire and London. The men pleaded guilty at trial to burglary and a variety of firearms offences. They were sentenced at Sheffield Crown Court. Thanks to Ollie Taylor for the story. DEFRA has launched a new online reporting system to report dead wild birds in the UK. The service is in response to the ongoing avian influenza outbreak. It is available to use 24-7 and aims to make it quicker and simpler for the public to report dead birds. The advice is to use the service if people find one or more dead birds of prey, such as owls, hawks or buzzards. Also to use the service if they find three or more dead birds that include at least one gull, swan, goose or duck. If people find five or more dead birds of any species, the public is urged to report it. Some of the birds will be collected for testing. For more, see the link below. A celebrity mountain lion that lived in the heart of Los Angeles has been put down. The puma spent at least a decade living in the heart of Hollywood and sightings of it frequently made local news. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife made the decision to euthanize the big cat after it was hit by a car. The 12-year-old mountain lion had a range of other health issues. And finally, is this the world's most remarkable fox? A video doing the rounds on social media shows a two-legged fox apparently surviving on earthworms, a normal part of a fox's diet. What an incredible animal. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts, and wishing you a very Merry Christmas. buying shooting kits then head to kit finder and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the uk kit finder the shooting kit comparison website Now let's hear from Kayap Brin, who is making venison burgers this week.
So I've been sent this meat mincer or grinder from Weschenfelder. Really, really good piece of kit. Processed many, many deer with my one as well. So today, I've got my offcuts from the haunch. When I say offcuts, they're decent quality steak bits there. And I'm gonna mince up with some of the venison game burger mix that they've given me. We're gonna put that with some water, patty it up, and make some delicious burgers. Never used it before, and uh, we'll give it a go. So, first thing we are gonna do is turn it on. I've got the plunger here, and I've already cut them into small pieces, so we're just gonna just chuck Chuck these in and push it down. There we go, it's coming out now. Keep pushing it down. We've got roughly about 1.5 kilos of freshly ground venison there. I'm going to put 500 grams of pork fat in it. It's personal preference, sometimes I leave it out. Um, but I'm going to try it with this today. We've got a third of the packet of that venison again, just over a third of a packet, but that's just kind of the seasoning and, and the bits and pieces that we got in there. So, and then to finish that off, we're gonna put about a third of a pint of cold water. So, I'd say that's enough. Now we're gonna mix it together. It smells really good. Some people mix the mince twice. I like, I don't like for it to kind of break up too much, so I only put it through the grinder once. So we are gonna start pressing out our burgers now. Get the first one on there. I think I can only fit one on the pan. That's a nice sound, you hear that? Shh. To measure this with the bun, now see where we're at. Oh well, we've got a bit of overhang there. <laughs> it's not bad, it's better than being the other way around, right? Yeah. You don't want a tiny little burger with a big bun. You want a big burger with a smaller bun, <laughs> if, if it was gonna be that way around. I love a good bit of gouda. It melts really nicely, it's got a nice creamy flavour, and I think it goes perfectly with burgers. Let's put this monster on there, shall we? Oh my goodness, amazing. Uh, layer on some nice tomatoes. I mean, look at that. Is that a burger or is that a burger? That's a burger. A textbook burger. Go on, cut it in half, because I'm starving, but I'll have half, you have half. Okay, okay, let me get a knife. Let me get a knife. I almost don't want to cut it in half, because it just looks no, so no, good. No, no, no. <laughs> it's better than messy. Mmm. I've got to go for another bite here. That's delicious. We have 10% off some Weschenfelder products. Details of that below. They're the sponsors behind Kai's recipes. Next, Precision Rifle is a new action shooting sport for the UK that's making waves. We head to the home of shooting to watch it in action. If PRS is a track day for your hunting rifle, then it's making its first appearance at Silverstone. Bisley has opened its doors to precision rifle shooting. It's hugely exciting for us. I think we've been trying maybe four or five years, even longer, to bring it into Bisley. It's a new progressive sport, obviously. It's very new to us here. So today's a fantastic day, really good turnout. This is a moment to cherish for the competitors and organisers. An event hosted here shows this dynamic shooting discipline has arrived. I woke up this morning and thought, wow, it's actually happening. I've set up the match, the steels are out, the props are out. 
we're going to shoot steel at Bisley. Yeah, so yeah, I'm really excited. <laughs> even even the range officers are excited. I mean, Steve, Steve I spoke to you before, was super chuffed. Yeah, they are. It's something new. It's a very dynamic sport. So it's, it's bringing in new blood into the sport and uh, more people that come to Bisley and can shoot at the NRA, the better. Now, these rifles may look different to a stalking or foxing rifle, but they really are not. Just as you'd change your tyres before hitting the track, these guys just change the chassis. And if you think about it, these flat-bottomed forends are much better designed to rest on a five-bar gate. The, the skills really transfer very, very well. If this is the speed of time that it takes me to shoot a fox these days is half what it used to. Because if you can, if you can deal with it under this pressure, then off a gate with nobody watching is, is no hassle at all. First position is up here, bag only, two shots close, one shot far. Down to here, you have to bag in that rim. The competition itself requires the shooter to shoot a set of targets at different ranges while finding the most stable shooting position on a stand that can be made of pretty much anything. There are no moderators, the barrels get hot and the guys play with lots of different calibres to keep the recoil to a minimum. The biggest difference is, is in, the, uh, in the cartridges, so you know, your traditional cartridges, 308, it recoils quite heavily, you know, 6.5 has been the predominant cartridge for the past couple of years in the UK. And now what we're seeing is more and more of the smaller cartridges, I mean I'm shooting a 6mm um, 47. Impact. There's other guys who are shooting 6mm BR, 6mm Dasher, and the whole point being is the smaller, more efficient cartridges. Less recoil, it allows you to spot your shots easier. Is that any good for hunting, Ryan? Oh, absolutely. With uh, an elevated position, uh, being nice and prone and comfortable, it's exceptionally good for pulling fallow quickly and quite noisily with a muzzle brake on. Bloody loud TV! <laughs> <laughs> The top competitors in the world are the Americans. They are the ones to beat. Someone who has them in their sights is a special guest at Bisley, Marcus from Sweden. In Sweden we maybe have four to six good matches every year of good quality, like the big ones, two-day matches. In the US they have one every weekend. So anyone who's really wanting to get into it and really put an effort into it, you can go shoot a good match every weekend. Obviously matches is where you get better. You can always practice at a range, but to get really good you have to go to a match. Are they more targeting or are they still the sort of the hunting frame of mind? As There's, well? I mean, some of the top guys over there, they all skip national level matches to go coyote hunting or elk hunting. Like I know, so, I know some guys who have skipped like big finales. But said, no, 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 I got an elk tag. <laughs> so and that's the truth. Like they're all, most of them are hunters. Okay. Same, same thing in Sweden. Okay. Marcus also believes that this style of shooting makes you a more accomplished shot in the field. One thing I learned today is that the chassis, they're super practical when you go and shoot foxes. Yeah, yeah, it's, for, for foxes, especially when you have like an arc rail underneath a chassis, you can just set it up on a tripod. That's what I do when I go foxing. I can just set myself back under the tree, put on the tripod, clamp on the rifle, just sit there, call for the fox. Rifle set up and real nice, good accuracy, you know, good balance. And obviously your capability as a shooter improves massively once you go out to matches and, you know, for an experienced shooter, 10-inch uh, target at 400 yards, it's peanuts. And also when, so when a fox shows up at 300, this is like, eh, you know, quite easy. Although this kit may look the dogs, it's the same wolf with just a different jacket on, making this sport super accessible. Now tell me, why Bagara? What's, what is it about Bagara for you? Um, I've been shooting Bagara for four years. I, I love them. They've, they've, they've done me proud to be honest. This one here um, is in an XLR industry stock and it's on its fourth barrel now. The action's done really well, it's never seized up, the bolt's never never got junk in it, it runs perfectly smooth. The bolt is beautiful actually, it's, it's almost as smooth, it is as smooth as a custom action. But you could pick up a Bagara for 11, 1200 pounds and you could throw yourself straight in the deep end and come and do this and you'll be off to the races for two years with that rifle. The Bagara HMR Pro is just the sort of kit Josh is talking about. So for the standard B14 HMR, you're looking around about 1,200. If you're talking about the HMR Pro with the upgraded action, then you're looking at about 2,400 in the UK. Cheaper the price, Christian. Sorry, I, I missed the question. <laughs> I just said cheaper the price. Cheaper the price, absolutely. It's very loud here, isn't it, Christian? Who decided to film here? Nuts. 
I think that was Josh, blame him. <laughs> it's his match, first time C2 Precision um, at Bisley, first Precision Rifle match. It's quite a momentous uh, day for Precision Rifle shooting in the UK. PRS is big business in the US and it is clearly gathering momentum here and across Europe. As well as being a lot of fun, it hones skills and, according to everyone we speak to, takes your hunting to a whole new level. For more information about Bergara rifles, go to ruag.co.uk. And if you'd like to stretch your barrels and spend some time with an encouraging, knowledgeable bunch, then go to gbpra.co.uk to find out how to join in. Thanks, Josh, and all who helped with that film. Now, the government is pushing for a ban on all lead ammo. Here's where we are with that. The Westminster government's new heavy-handed approach to banning lead pellets and bullets will be a disaster for rimfire and airgun shooting. That's the conclusion of the National Small Ball Rifle Association, the GB governing body for disciplines using this ammunition, many of which are Olympic sports. Short and long-range small ball target shooting will... I hate to say collapse, but it will be in a real bad place. The main reason for that is even we, from the research that we've done, the lower levels of, uh, of competitor will still be able to outshoot the best of the lead-free ammunition. The problem with that is it will turn the whole competition structure into a lottery. Non-toxic air gun pellets and rimfire rounds are not accurate enough for target shooting. It will mean an end to Olympic hopes for many GB target shooters. The problem began in May 2022. The UK's health and safety executive began a six-month public consultation on proposals to ban most lead bullets and lead pellets for outdoor target shooting and hunting, plus a ban on the sale and use of lead shot. It closed in November 2022. It is unclear when the legislation will come, but when it does come, it's likely to mark a speedy end to the use of lead. Basque says if the transition periods are too short, it will have a massive impact on shooting in the UK. So our position is that we remain committed to the transition away from lead for, for live quarry and shot, but the transition periods in the HSC restriction dossier are not sufficient based on the technical issues around small calibres currently. Back in 2020, the shooting organisations fell in with the government chief medical officer's line that there is no safe level for lead in the human body. They took the initiative and agreed that shooters in England should, over five years, phase out lead shot and plastic wads in shotgun cartridges used for game shooting. Since then, the war in Ukraine and the effects of Covid on supply chains and manufacturing suggest that five years will not be long enough. The HSC aims to hurry up this process and extend it into other forms of shooting and different types of ammunition. It wants to force a change in the way Britain's half a million active shotgun and firearm certificate holders and an estimated 12 million airgun owners go shooting. It's my understanding that obviously reading the Gun Trade Association's papers and submissions to the HSC that obviously there's supply chain issues, there's compound powder issues, there's uh, component issues across the board regarding the ammunition that supplies, especially uh, rifle ammunition, and therefore this needs to be taken into account. At the time that we noted our transition period, no one knew that there was going to be obviously a war in Ukraine. The COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine has had a massive impact on manufacturing. The gun trade has switched its focus from sporting to military. Cartridge manufacturers also say they're struggling to raise the finance and machinery to replace lead shot with steel shot. If shooting sports collapse because of an unworkable government ban, it will affect the UK's rural landscape. If the time frames are too short and unrealistic based on the evidence that we have submitted along with the other shooting organisations, 
then it will be, have a tremendous effect on the amount of pest control that's undertaken. If pest control is not undertaken, then the conservation work won't be undertaken. Species will suffer because of it. Uh, crops, again, will suffer because of it. We already have to import a significant amount of crop into this country and food, so therefore we don't want to have to be doing any more of that, especially with what's going on. As well, economically, if people cannot get the ammunition they need, they won't be going shooting, as you well know. Therefore, rural communities will suffer because of it. Shooters struggle with the phase-out of lead. Livens Gun Shop in Staffordshire says its customers are concerned and confused, especially about the changes to ammunition for deer and foxes. They're worried about and a little concerned about expansion on uh, bullets, you know, and what, what non-toxic bullets, you know, what effects they'll have. And a lot of hunters tend to develop their own loads, so they're they're a little concerned with that. So it's it's all a bit up in the air. People are asking a lot of questions and we we as a dealer can't really answer some of them as far as you know what bullets you know ballistically are like non-toxic wise, you know, what what effects they're gonna have. Basque has prepared a series of new technical reports to illustrate where the banning of lead isn't necessary or requires a longer time frame. This includes smaller rifle calibres and 22 rimfire rifles, as well as airgun ammunition. Basque's report on airgun ammunition concludes there should be no restrictions as there is limited risk to the environment and any risk to human health can be managed through existing sector guidance on game meat handling. We have undertaken some tests around weight retention of pellets, penetration testing and accuracy testing and actually there is no residual lead left so with good game handling skills, the removal of cha um, wound chambers, there is negligible risk to human health. Shooters fear that the proposed changes are being driven by people who want to ban shooting, not just shooting with lead ammunition. If there's going to be legislation, which we don't believe that there should be, we are still very much for a voluntary transition, then we're expecting at least a five-year time frame. And for 2-2 rimfire, we are saying that we want them to ensure that there is sufficient amount of ammunition. When I say 2-2 rimfire, I mean all rimfires. We need to ensure that there are sufficient amounts of ammunition available and at that time when they are available and then there should be a five-year transitional period from that point. It will be devastating, there's no question about it. There aren't any viable alternatives either for uh, small bore rifle target shooting or for air rifle target shooting for the various disciplines that we cover. I think we need to obviously control lead in some way because it is a, a poison. There's no doubt about it. But I think that if they were to look at the way that we control lead now and the systems that we already have in place, it should be quite sufficient to make sure that everyone's safe. Thanks to all who took part in that. And Deborah's article on it, which goes alongside the film, is on our website. Next, from pellets and shots to thermal, Mark Ripley, better known on YouTube as 260 Rips, talks about the Hick Micro Alpex. We have got here the Hick Micro Alpex scope, and we've got that sat on the CZ45222 LR rifle. The scope is a night vision scope. It gives a very good, very sharp colour day screen on there. We can then change that to a, a night vision mode. Now you get a black and white night vision image through this, and uh, it's also very, very good at last light. So when with a naked eye, you're basically just looking into darkness. With this, you still retain a colour image for quite a while after dark. And then you go over to night vision mode using the IR illuminator, which will clip on the top there. This one you'll see I've made a slight modification there. I've just put a fishing coaster on the front there, a bit basic, but the idea being that with that, it makes it a lot easier when you're behind the, the rifle to be able to just reach forward and just with your fingertips, just adjust that for fine focus. So the scope itself is a 30 mil body tube on there. So you can use standard day optic mounts with that. Here we're using some sports match mounts on there. It's got a rechargeable battery built into this. You've also got the option to run it on a CR123A battery in the top there. It's got a zoom on the side, nice smooth zoom. And it will also record directly to an inbuilt memory. So the basic controls of this scope, uh, we've got three buttons just on the eyepiece here. You've got your power button, 
you've got a record button, although this does have a setting where it will automatically record triggered by the recoil of the rifle, so it will go back 10, 20, whatever you choose seconds previous to the shot. That button swaps it between uh, night vision and day vision, and also it um, does the picture-in-picture -picture mode. The main menu functions are accessed via the turret on the side here. You just push and hold that to enter the main menu. You've got uh, four times zoom on here, and you've also got the option to have picture-in-picture -picture mode. So you get the superimposed little screen at the top of the, the main screen, which allows you to aim a little bit more precisely, or you can just use the wheel on the side there, which gives you very smooth zoom from one times to four times magnification. I will generally use the picture-in-picture -picture mode to aim with, um, particularly on a longish sort of shot, but it does give you the ability to see everything around you as well. So potentially if there's something else coming into the line of fire, you see it a lot better than what you would just in the picture-in-picture -picture mode. So it basically does uh, everything that a standard night vision scope would do and, and more, and with a nice clear image too. Thanks, Mark. Next, from tech to the best hunting and shooting films on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up this week, a lovely film from the National Gamekeepers Organization, with a group of youngsters experiencing their first game shoot. Here's a very different type of young shots experience. Two professional hunters guide their sons, aged 13 and 11, as they shoot their first elephant. Over to the States, where the wooded beardsman is battling squirrels, using a bait station and a catapult. He hits a few, but Wayne Martin needn't worry just yet. The Suffolk and Norfolk Rat Pack are out on a frosty morning, making short work of some massive rats on a pig farm. Here's one for the shotgun shooters. Lloyd Patterson gives a straightforward explanation of the difference between a sporting clay gun and a game shooting over and under. County deer stalking are out with the Capriolas Club on a seeker management cull, taking 21 in just 24 hours, thanks to Peter Jones for sending that one in. Here's a very different approach to deer stalking. Kendall Gray buys the cheapest rifle and ammo in Walmart and sets out to prove it can do the job. Finally, no hunting in this one, but an interesting discussion about finding deer by understanding what makes them tick. It's US-based, but the principles apply equally to any quarry and location. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain, which is out every Wednesday at 7 p.m. UK time. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing. Happy Christmas and goodbye. <laughs>